One of the most common objects that you see represented by a graph is a map. And this is really handy for us to think about graphs in terms of a map or a, a collection of places connected by pathways, roads, or other kinds of connections, because it allows us to put ourselves mentally in the graph. And we can imagine ourselves actually being at a particular vertex of the graph and moving around in the graph. And this is not only a useful metaphor, and sometimes it's the first metaphor for graphs. Uh, it was one of the motivating problems for graphs. We'll talk about it when we talk about the uh, bridges of Konigsberg. But if you want to take that intuition and turn it into something uh, a little bit more formal, what you arrive at is something called a walk in the graph. And a walk in a graph G of length K is going to be just a sequence of vertices We'll call them v0 up to vk. You notice that there's actually k plus 1 vertices. The length is going to be the number of edges. Um, and it has to have the following property that uh, vi, vi plus 1, right, this pair, has to be an edge in the graph. Okay, and that's for all i, right, from 0 up to uh, k minus uh, two, right? So, if, so I get, I go from i to i plus one, i plus one to i plus two. Uh, each one of these steps in the walk has to be an edge. So here's a concrete example. Here's a sequence of vertices. I've labeled the vertices with letters. And so this is, string is a sequence and I can go, okay, I'm gonna go A to B, B to D, D to E, E to D, D to F, F to G, G to D, and that's it, okay? If it makes it a little bit clearer, you can kind of see it going like this, around and back and here, and all the way around. Okay, so this is a valid walk, and we would have to check that it really was. We would check that, you know, that AB was an edge and BD was an edge, and I actually did do that manually as I walked around the graph. So you can think of my finger as sort of taking the walk. As I go vertex to vertex, every time I make a jump, I better be going along an edge. Now, specifically, we're going to call this kind of walk an AD walk in this case, because it starts at A and ends at D. Okay, ends at D. Okay, so that is a walk in a graph. Now, Continuing with the theme that we've been going through so far, uh, I'm going to take this notion of a walk and I'm going to recast it to re understand it strictly in terms of homomorphisms. Because in fact, a walk just is a homomorphism from a path into the graph. Okay, so for instance, here is my path of length 8. And if I take a mapping from this path, I'm going to map each of these vertices into a vertex in the graph. If, in fact, it's a homomorphism, then it has to be that every one of these edges, like, for instance, the edge 1, 2 here, has to map to an edge. So I think if I looked at the path I had, if I recall, it was A, B, D, E, D, F, G, D. Um, actually, I didn't recall that. I just copied it from uh, from over there. And of course, I copied it wrong. I put two Ds in a row there. There we go. I think that was our sequence. And so that means like zero is going to map to A. I won't draw all the lines because it'll get messy in a hurry. Um, one maps to B. Two maps to D. Okay. And so if I looked at this particular edge one, two, we would see that the edge one, two, maps to 1 went to B, 2 went to D. So that's B, D, okay? And that this edge really is an edge in the graph. And so this extra condition that we usually put on the vertices in the, in the walk, that the adjacent vertices in the walk have to be edges in the graph, is sort of already encoded in our definition of a homomorphism. So the ith vertex in the walk, we call it VI, and we're just saying that VI should be defined to be wherever the walk places it. So it's W sub V here, right? The, the, the part of the morphism that maps the vertices of the ith vertex, okay? 
this is one of the cases where it's also handy that we defined this canonical path graph to have a vertex set that starts at zero. Um, and I guess this is, uh, this is actually not quite right. Is this right? Yes, this is right. Okay, good. So P8 here, remember the vertex set of P8, uh, the vertex set, uh, I hate having double subscripts, but P8's vertex set is just zero to seven, which we write like this. You can think of the walk as just a sequence of vertices where every pair is an edge, um, but you can also now think of it as a homomorphism from the canonical path into the graph. And now I've had to pick a particular length here. So this is a, a walk of length m, where again, m is the number of edges. All right. Okay. Once you can walk around in a graph, you get a new notion, which is one that I think is pretty intuitive. It's one that you see immediately once you start drawing pictures of graphs, is this idea of a graph being connected. So the definition for us is going to be that a graph is connected if for every pair of vertices in the graph, there's a walk that starts at one and ends at the other. I guess we should also allow for walks of length zero, a vertex will be connected to itself. And here's an important theorem about connectivity. And it's one that, again, that becomes kind of obvious from pictures, but if you want to prove it rigorously, you got to think just a bit, is that being connected is a graph invariant. So if two, if you have a graph that's connected and another graph that's isomorphic to it, that other graph is also connected. If, if we're going to prove it, let's do it. So let's suppose we have this isomorphism and G is connected. And so I want to prove that H is connected. And then um, I think I'll leave the converse as an exercise here. So we want to show that H must also be connected. So what we do is for any vertices UV in H, so I've got two vertices over in H, and then I'm going to have vertices that correspond to these two in the, in the graph G. So let's let uh, W, it's going to be our walk. It's going to be a uh, walk that goes from well, it goes from F, the inverse of U. Remember that FV is going to be a bijection for isomorphism. So it goes, we kind of pull these vertices back into G. F inverse of V. This is going to be a walk um, between these two in G, which must exist because if G is connected, then every pair of vertices are connected by a walk. That's the definition of being connected. Just a reminder of our types here, let's just be clear, right? W is a map, it's a homomorphism from some path, let's call it length k, into G. WV of zero, that is the first vertex in the path, is going to map to U. I'm sorry, no, it ma this is in G, so it maps to uh, F inverse of U. And the last vertex in this walk is uh, F inverse of V. All right, so it's a walk, right? It's a homomorphism from the path into the graph. It starts at this vertex and ends at this vertex. So now what we do is we just, again, apply the same trick that we did for colorings. If you recall, we're just going to compose these two homomorphisms. So F composed with W is now a homomorphism from PK into H. So that means it's a walk. And it's in the graph H, and it has this property now that if I looked at on the vertex set, F composed W on the vertices, if I look at the start of this walk at zero, well, that would be FV of WV of zero which is FV of FV inverse of U. Oops, I got an extra parenthesis there, which is equal to U. And similarly, if I look at the end of this walk, F of W of at, at uh, K, right, the last vertex in the walk, um, and I work out the same thing, you'll see that it's going to be just applying the same definitions, it's going to be equal to V. 
So what, I, what that means is that this walk that I constructed in H is a walk that goes from U to V. So there exists a UV walk in H. Now you'll notice that I just took any pair of vertices in H and I found a walk. So for any pair of vertices in H, I was able to find a walk, therefore H is connected. So I proved that if G is connected, then H is connected. Um, and then symmetrically, you know, you could have the isomorphism going the other way. If H is connected, then G will also be connected, and therefore um, we're done. And that, that proves that just being connected is a graph invariant. And again, this is one that's not surprising, but to kind of prove it correctly, you would really need to show how paths or walks in one graph get pushed into the walks in the other graph. And the isomorphism is the way we go between the two isomorphic graphs, and it is a homomorphism. So if we understand the walk also as a homomorphism, composition allows us to kind of just push the walk from one into the other. All right. Here's some kind of fundamental definitions then. So once we have the definition of a walk, we can talk about what a path is. And a path is just going to be an injective walk. Right? So remember that the morphism, the homomorphism is injective if uh, the corresponding functions are injective, which really just means it needs to have the vertices, uh, the, map, the function on vertices has to be injective. So this is the same as saying there's no repeated vertices. So you can, uh, so the path then is just going to be a walk where I don't repeat any vertices. And a closed walk um, is going to have this other property that it starts and ends at the same vertex. So um, now it's going to sometimes be the case that we're going to have a walk that walks around. It maybe repeats some vertices, but it doesn't repeat any edges. In other words, if the function on edges is injective, then we'll call it a trail. So again, no, a trail could repeat vertices, but it doesn't repeat edges. And then a tor is just going to be a closed walk that's also a trail, right? So it's a closed walk such that we is injective. So it begins and ends at the same point doesn't repeat any edges, but obviously it does repeat some vertices because it at least repeats the first and the last vertices. Okay, so again, these are, these are um, standard concepts in graph theory and you should try to get comfortable understanding them in two completely different ways, right? One being like paths as sequences of vertices where we don't repeat any, and all of these can be thought of as you know, sequences of vertices connected by edges, um, but you should also try to understand them in terms of of being homomorphisms from a path into the graph. Now, um, closed walks actually are kind of a, a, a special case because it might make more sense to think of the closed walk as a homomorphism from the cycle into the graph, right? Because the cycle already has this property that it begins and ends at the same vertex once you start going around. We're going to talk about cycles in the graph is just going to be an injective closed walk, where now we're going to think of closed walks uh, in terms of being a homomorphism from the cycle into the graph. So here's an example that's not injective up here, because you'll see that, I guess, depends on where we start, but let's say that this is our, our first vertex, and this is, if we give this a name, this is the first vertex in the walk. And so if it goes around, uh, it goes here, 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 this vertex and this one get mapped to this one, right? So the, as a function on the vertices, it's not injective. And so as a homomorphism, it's not injective, but it is a homomorphism, right? Every edge here maps to an edge here. And so it's a closed walk. If this homomorphism were injective, then we would call it a cycle. And so the cycle, again, being injective, it's a little bit like in the case of a path, it says that you're not gonna repeat any vertices as you go around. And if you don't repeat any vertices, then you definitely don't repeat any edge. Let's kind of try to solidify this idea a little bit with a little exercise. So it's a pretty straightforward exercise. Let's just check that having a cycle is a graph invariant. So let's just suppose I have a graph G 
and let's let G be isomorphic to H, okay? So if G has a cycle, if G has a cycle, then there's some homomorphism from the cycle, the canonical cycle graph, into G for some K. We don't care what the K is. Okay, so I have a cycle in G, um, and the claim then to say that this is invariant, I just have to show that then I also have a cycle in H. And, um, and so this gives us a chance to kind of use this same trick again and again, uh, which is we can find a cycle in H, just by composing these two. So F composed with W oops, is a homomorphism CK. First it ma W maps CK to G and then F maps G to H. So this goes CK to H. And so I have this, this is a closed walk in H, but also F and W are injective. Right, because this is a cycle, so this has to be injective, and the composition of these injective homomorphisms is also injective. F composed W is a cycle in H. All right, all right. So it may seem like we're actually kind of using the word cycle now to mean two different things, but it should always be clear from the context. Like you can think of it as the sequence of vertices, but really you could also think of it as the homomorphism from the canonical cycle into the graph. In this case, for a cycle now, then it has to be an injective homomorphism from the canonical cycle into our graph. And this corresponds to the, the feeling you might get when you say, okay, well, I could find the cycle by kind of tracing around it and not touching, touching back to any spots that I've hit before. And that process of doing that is exactly just describing the homomorphism from a canonical cycle into the graph. Okay. All right, let's stop there.